It's fantastic what you can find on the internet these days, isn't it? I came across a document recently giving plot summaries of classic novels, just a brief paragraph with a summary of about 60 classic novels, telling you in a few lines what the novel's all about. So Frankenstein, debating the ethics of medical advancements and experimentation isn't confined to the present day. In 1816, Shelley considered the moral issues surrounding the creation of life. When Dr. Frankenstein makes a living creature out of human parts, taken mainly from the bodies of convicts, he discovers that instead of a creating a miracle, he has made a monster. The consequences are far-reaching and horrifying. <laughs> there you are, Frankenstein, in three sentences. It's great. I can impress my friends with how well-read I am without having to wade through hundreds of pages of Charles Dickens or Thomas Hardy or the Brontes. I can know what the book is about without the effort of reading it. And I'm not suggesting that we do this with Luke's gospel, um, but as we got into it the last few weeks, uh, I think we're beginning to see what the book is about. And it's not primarily about how you and I can get to heaven, though it has some important things to say about that. It's not primarily about how we should live as disciples, so it has much to say about that. It's primarily about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And in these first few chapters, Luke selects particular incidents and events and sayings from Jesus' life that illustrate who he is and why he came. And he continues his theme in chapter 5, which we're going to look at this morning, and into the beginning of chapter 6. Uh, and we planned 25 sermons, I think it is, on, on Luke's Gospel this year, which sounds an awful lot, but that only works out as one uh, sermon per chapter. And there's an enormous amount in, in each chapter. Um, and I'm not going to be able to cover the whole of chapter 5 this morning. I'm going to miss out a little, a fascinating little bit about fasting towards the end of the chapter, I'm afraid. I'm going to miss out Jesus' description of his message as new wine at the very end. New wine, Jesus says, is not just a, a development of the old, but something new and radical and amazing. And I was pity to miss that out because it would have given me a great opportunity for another plug for the new wine celebration that some of us are going to go to in, in July. Um, and if you're if you're interested in that, please have a word with uh, Karina or Bev, who's not here this morning, and they'll tell you all about it. So this morning, we've got time to look at just four episodes that Luke records that tell us something about Jesus. And I've, I've subtitled these, The Call of Jesus, The Compassion of Jesus, The Command of Jesus, and The Challenge of Jesus. If you were here last week, we had five Ps. Uh, this morning, we've got four C's. So the call of Jesus. I wonder how Peter would have felt that morning when Jesus commandeered his, his boat uh, that we saw in the reading that Mark read to us. I, I imagine that he'd been quite happy uh, to let Jesus use it to teach the crowds. I suspect Jesus, that Peter was very interested in his teaching, probably quite moved by it. But then, after the crowds are gone, how do we think Peter felt uh, when Jesus started teaching him how to fish? There's Peter, whose business was fishing, who made a living from it, who probably thought he knew all there was to know about catching fish. Peter, who was dead tired, having spent the previous night up trying to fish and catching nothing, tired and disappointed, and what's more, there'd been this huge crowd on the beach all day. Any fish with any sense would have swum miles away, wouldn't they? And suddenly there's this carpenter from Nazareth telling him how to go about his business. And if it had been me, if I'd have been Peter, I'd have been saying to myself, what does this guy know about fishing? He says, the carpenter, how dare he tell me what to do? And I sense a tone of reluctance in what he says. Uh, there in whatever verse it is in the middle. Uh, because you say so, I will let down the nets. A sense of reluctance. And 
I suspect that we can often feel the same. We're happy to come to church on a Sunday and listen to what Jesus has said and done in the past. But when it comes to the way we, we live our lives now, when it comes to how we spend our money or how we use our time or how we fill in our tax return, well, that's our business. That's got nothing to do with Jesus. And Jesus teaches Peter, doesn't he, that that's not true. He does know what he's talking about. He's concerned with all areas of our life. In fact, he works a miracle. They caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break, we read. So they call their fellow fishermen, James and John, to come and help. And they were all, as we read at the end there, they were all astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And Peter recognises that this is not just chance, not just beginner's luck. This is a miracle. And he's standing in front of something who's really special. And I guess his reaction is the same as ours would have been. Besides this special person, I'm totally inadequate. I fall far short. I'm a sinful man. I'm sure there may have been times when... Um, Ray or Mark have dreams of playing for Chelsea. <laughs> uh, uh, running out at Stamford Bridge wearing the blue kit. But imagine if that dream suddenly came true. There you are in the middle of the pitch, a stadium full of cheering crowds. You're surrounded by super fit, incredibly skillful athletes, and they pass the ball to you. You'd feel totally inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> With respect, Mark, <laughs> you'd die of embarrassment, wouldn't you? You'd hope the ground would open up and swallow you up. Because you might think you're pretty good when it comes to kicking a football around in the park, but you're nothing like the skill and fitness of a Premier League footballer. You're not in the same league. You're not even on the same planet. And I suspect that's how Peter felt. And all he could do is blurt out, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And I think that we feel the same at those times when we catch a glimpse of God, of who he really is and who we are. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And Jesus' words to Peter and to us, I think, are reassuring because he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. The word he uses for fish there uh, is used metaphorically in the Old Testament for taking prisoners alive. Peter and his friends will no longer be catching dead fish, but dealing with captured people and restoring them to life. That's great. That's the mission of the first disciples, and that is a mission. This is the mission for his disciples today. And Luke tells us they left everything. They pull, so they pull their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. A little later in the chapter, uh, we see he uses the same uh, phrase uh, when it comes to Levi, another person who became Jesus' disciple. He left everything. So is that what we must do if we're to be a disciple of Jesus today? What does it mean? We take this literally. Are we to sell up our houses and become nomads, live in a commune with other disciples? And some Christians have done that through the ages. They've taken those words literally. Uh, and in one sense, I think, no. Because, because why? Because we believe that the apostles knew much more of Jesus' teaching than we do. And we also believe that God is behind the whole of their Bible, and therefore it's quite legitimate to use one part of the Bible to interpret another part. And we see that the apostles didn't teach that converts should sell up everything in order to follow Jesus. In fact, we read that the apostle John had a home and that he took Jesus' mother to, to live in that home after Jesus had died. So now in that sense, 
But I believe in another sense, the answer is yes. We have to give up everything. Because, because Jesus is not content to be in second place in our lives. He is now Lord. He has the ultimate say over our lives. Being a Christian is not a sort of add-on to the rest of our lives. It's not, not just what we do on a Sunday so that we can get on with the rest of, of the week with a clear conscience. Being a Christian is saying Jesus is Lord over all our life. And that sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? Even fanatical to some. But it is the call of Jesus. Let's, let's divert for a few moments from Luke's Gospel. Let's look quickly at what Jesus says to Peter on this subject on another occasion, uh, after Peter has been following Jesus for a while. Um, remember the story of the rich young man who came to Jesus and boasted about how he'd kept all the commandments, and Jesus said to him that he needed to go and sell all he had and follow him. And after he's gone... Uh, Jesus turned to his disciples, and Jesus really emphasized how hard it will be for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. He says it twice, I think. And that's always struck me as rather strange, um, because the disciples weren't rich, were they? They were poor, and they had given up everything to follow Jesus. So why does Jesus put such an emphasis on this? To his disciples, surely he's preaching to the converted. But I think if we read the passage carefully, we see that by riches, Jesus isn't talking just about money. We can be rich in other things, can't we? We can be rich in fame or in reputation or in knowledge or in our intellectual ability and in all sorts of things. And those things can take us away from God. But we read on in, in Mark's gospel, then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Do we have to give out everything to follow Jesus? Yes, we do. Um, it may sound as if we have to give up too much to follow Jesus, even friends and family, but Jesus reassures us that what we get in return will be a hundred times as much, even in this present age, let alone in the family to come. How does that work? Let me tell you a story. Uh, I heard about a Christian in prison where, in a country were persecuted for, where Christians were persecuted for their faith, uh, in Southern America, I think. Um, and the rules in the prison were that prisoners were allowed to receive letters, but only from members of their family. And the Warden came to him one day with a letter from Brazil, and he said, the letter from Brazil. Have you got family in Brazil? And the guy thought for a moment and said, oh, yes. Yes, I've got family in Brazil. So, and then a, a week later, there was a letter from Poland, and the warden said, have you got family in Poland? He said, yes. And then another one a week later from the United States. We've got family in the United States. And the guy said, yes. Uh, and the warden said, well, you, you must have a very big family. <laughs> and this Christian said, yes, I have. My family runs to millions throughout the world. If we give up everything, if we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, then we become a member of the worldwide family of his followers and have access to any number of homes. Let's go on to the compassion of Jesus and look at this a bit more briefly. Um, 
But we will look at it because it's a lovely illustration, I think, of the compassion of Jesus. Imagine what it must have felt like to be a leper at the time of Jesus. You develop a skin disease. There's no treatment, no medicines. So suddenly you're banished from the community. You're cut off from all your family and loved ones. You're an outcast living outside the city so that that disease isn't passed on to others. Isolated, rejected. I can't imagine how that would have felt. <laughs> and Luke records how Jesus encountered one of these people who was covered in leprosy, we read. And he must have heard about Jesus and his power to heal. So it's no wonder that he fell on his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing, be clean. And he performs a miracle and heals this man. But before that, if you notice, uh, Luke records something extraordinary because he records Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Now, he didn't need to do that, did he? There was, wasn't something magic about Jesus' touch. Jesus healed plenty of people without touching them. But in this case, with this leper, who probably hadn't been touched for months or years. Year. Whether Jesus was sure that he would be immune from catching the disease from the man, or whether he thought that he was a risk that was prepared to take it, we don't know that. But as Jesus looked at this poor outcast leper, I'm sure he appreciated that it wasn't just the physical condition that he needed healing from, but the psychological effects of being separated from his family, rejected from society. And Jesus starts that psychological healing process by touching this man. That's fantastic. That's amazing. I believe Jesus is still in the healing business. Maybe we don't see much physical healing these days. Maybe we don't need it so much with advances in medicine, but he still reaches out and touches and brings mental and spiritual healing to many people. We must press on, but let's just note the picture that Luke paints of Jesus attracting crowds who come to hear his words and to be healed. Um, Jesus must have been under enormous pressure, mustn't he? Uh, surrounded by so many needy people. How did he cope? Well, Luke records that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. The word in the original for lonely places, as we were saying a few weeks ago, is wilderness. Um, how do we cope when the pressure mounts, when there seems to be so many needy people who demand our attention? I think I, for one, learn to le learn from Jesus to go often into the wilderness to pray, away from the mobile phone, away from the TV, away from all the other distractions, to go into the wilderness and pray. Well, we've talked about the call of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus. Let's think about the command of Jesus. Um, we need to read the next chunk of Chapter 5, and Val's going to do that for us. Val. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal those who were ill. Some men came carrying a paralysed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, 
Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Thanks, Val. Um, well, at this stage in his ministry, uh, Jesus had begun to attract the attention of the authorities, the, the sort of theologians of the time, the Pharisees and teachers of the law. So we read that they assembled from the local synagogues, even from Judea and Jerusalem. They probably stuck out like a sore thumb with their smart city clothes in, in downtown Galilee. Um, so I think theological seminar, uh, or for those associated with schools, think a sort of major Ofsted inspection. They'd come, who was this man Jesus? Was his teaching orthodox? And we can say, see a little bit of irony, I think, in Luke's account as he contrasts them with Jesus. They had come with the power to criticize and to destroy, but in the very next verse, Luke records, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So we can imagine the scene in the big house, uh, where it might have been a synagogue, Jesus surrounded by a great crowd, uh, but this time, not people who come to learn from his teaching or to be healed, but people who were there to check up on him, try and catch him out. No wonder that the, the only way the friends of this par paralyzed man had to get him close to Jesus was to make a hole in the roof. And as they lower him in front of Jesus, Jesus says something that's truly remarkable, shocking really to us, because um, he could see this poor paralyzed man lowered on a stretcher surely it was obvious what he really needed and yet jesus doesn't heal him he simply says friend your sins are forgiven and i think to jesus he had an even bigger need than what appeared to other people he needed to be forgiven from his sin the sin that separates from god not just in this life but in the life to come. And Jesus pronounces that he is forgiven. And the theological team, the Ofsted inspectors, if you like, are in sense, aren't they? Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they were quite right. Only God can forgive the sins against God. Imagine I'd um, driven into the car park this morning, not really concentrating, wasn't thinking. My foot slips off the pedal, and I put a big scratch right down Mark and Emma's car, fairly new car. Don't worry, I didn't. <laughs> um, and then I come into church, and I spot Simon, and I go up to Simon, and I say, um, no, I'm terribly sorry, Simon. I've... I've a big scratch down Mark and Emma's car. And he says to me, that's all right, Tony. I forgive you. <laughs> that would be absurd, wouldn't it? <laughs> I need to go to Mark and Emma. <laughs> Only Mark and Emma can forgive me for what I've done to them. And our sin is against God, isn't it? And only God can forgive that. And we need that forgiveness, don't we? But we manage to push that out of our way of thinking often, to say, well, we're no worse than other people, so we must be okay. But the Bible says, no, we've sinned against God. Look at the way we've treated his creation, damaged our environment. And that suffering that's going to come on our children and grandchildren, how does God feel about that? Look at how we've been content to live in a society where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. There are nearly a hundred food banks in Surrey, did you know? 
one of the richest counties in the, in the UK. And Andrew was telling us the other morning, uh, a couple of weeks ago, that 37 families came to the food bank in Banstead on a single morning. Well, we can do the arithmetic, can't we? How does God feel about that? God who has a special heart for the poor. Our sin is against God. We can say with King David, can't we? Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And we need forgiveness. And the good news is that Jesus has the authority to forgive. No matter what we've done, we can be forgiven if we turn to him. And I hope you know that forgiveness this morning. Because it's liberating, it sets us free. If you don't, please don't leave without talking to me or to Simon or one of the other leaders. We'd love to talk to you about how we can know that we are forgiven by God. Back quickly to Luke's account. Luke doesn't, Jesus doesn't leave the paralyzed man there, but also heals him. The man gets up and carries his bed and walks home. Amazing. Yeah. A miracle. I've been in this plastic boot for 12 weeks now. Yeah. And I know that when it comes off, hopefully this week, uh, it's going to take weeks or months um, for muscles to rebuild, for tendons to gain strength. But this was a miracle. This man picked up his boat, his bed, and walked home. And Luke records, doesn't he? This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Of course not. This is Jesus. This is God the Son. <laughs> and lastly, yeah, the challenge of Jesus. Let me just uh, read these few verses. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi, Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. But the Pharisee and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Having established that Jesus has the authority on earth to forgive sins, it's not surprising that uh, the next episode that Luke records is an example of Jesus forgiving a sinner. Um, but this time it's not someone who needs physical healing, but it's a tax collector. And it seems that the Romans who imposed the taxes as the, as the, um, the governing authority, they, they delegated their collection of taxes uh, to local people, including this man Levi, uh, which probably signifies he was from the tri tribe of Levi, the tribe who were actually designated to be priests, but this, this guy had had uh, uh, slipped out of, the, of the, the norm and uh, become a tax collector. And the tax collectors had to make a living, so they were allowed to charge a sort of commission on top of the taxes. But, but like, uh, like people through the ages who have easy access to other people's money, it was all too easy to line their own pockets. I could say something about city bankers today, but... And the tax collectors were fairly universally despised, despised by ordinary citizens for exploiting their position and despised by the religious authorities for being collaborators with the Romans, the occupying power. So that is Levi. Um, universally despised, but not by Jesus. We don't know whether the Levi was similar to Zacchaeus, who Luke tells us about later in his gospel, who when he turned to God needed to repay people, he had overcharged. But we do know that Luke says that he left everything, the same phrase, and followed Jesus. And again, that might not be quite as straightforward as it seems. 
because I don't know how long it takes to arrange a great banquet and send out the invites, but it's got to be days, if not weeks, hasn't it? So I don't think he just packed up and went off down the road. Um, but he did give his heart to Jesus. Luke records, then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. And the Pharisees regarded the people who Levi invited to share the banquet with Jesus as tax collectors and sinners. Interesting that Levi hadn't abandoned his friends and his fellow tax collectors when he became a follower of Jesus, but he invited them to come and meet Jesus at a banquet. And I think the challenge of, of Jesus is to live in a simple world, but to resist sin and temptation. It's much easier to resist sin when we're closeted with our Christian friends on a Sunday morning, isn't it? But it's much harder when we get back to the office or the school on a Monday morning. Uh, some years later, Paul gave this command to Jesus' followers. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Living good lives amongst their Christian friends is relatively easy. Um, living lives among their non-Christian friends in a way that is indistinguishable from the crowd is also all too easy. But the scripture instructs us that we are to live good lives among our non-Christian friends. Not just good lives, such good lives that they are distinctive and lead people to recognize God in us, not being secret about our faith. That's the challenge that Jesus presents to his followers. I think that's the challenge that Jesus presented to Levi. And when the Pharisees take Jesus to task for breaking their rules about their, who they should eat with, he comes out with this classic statement, which James shared with us earlier. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not called, come to call the righteous, and we could put the word self before righteous. I have not come to call the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. I've not come to call the self-righteous, those who are numb to their sin, I think they're doing very well, thank you, but sinners who acknowledge their sin. If we're not well, the essential first step towards getting cured is to recognize that we're not well, isn't it? Only then are we going to seek help. Only then are we going to try and get a GP appointment. <laughs> um, if we just pretend to ourselves that there's nothing wrong, then there's no chance of getting the help we need. And if we're not conscious of how far short we fall of God's standards, then we're unlikely to seek him and ask for forgiveness. And what does Jesus come to call sinners to do? To repent, literally to change the way we think to turn from a life opposed to God and towards a life that seeks to please God. And as Simon was, was uh, saying a few weeks back, we tend to think of repent, of repent as something that we do when we first turn to Christ at the start of our Christian life. But I think that's much too narrow. We forget, don't we, that uh, uh, the first and last recorded commands of Jesus to his listeners were to repent. And the last wasn't to the ungodly, it was to the church, the church in Laodicea. It's not just something that we need to do at the start of our Christian journey, it's what we need to do frequently as we follow Jesus as Lord. When uh, Martin Luther kicked off the Reformation in 1517, nailed up his 95 Theses, on the door of the church at Wittenberg. Does anybody know what was number one on his list of what the church needed to do? Repent. <laughs> yes, it was. 
Number one says this, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed that the entire life of believers be one of repentance. I don't think Luther also always got it right, but I believe he did in this instance. As we continue on our Christian journey, I, for one, become more conscious of the presence of sin and the need to repent and to ask for forgiveness. And sometimes I think we can feel a bit superior, can't we, to our brothers and sisters in the Church of England. We criticise their regular repetition of the Lord's Prayer. I'm glad we had it this morning. But we can easily forget, can't we, that when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, da, 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 forgive us our sins. Do we? Is that a regular part of our prayer? Perhaps we feel that uh, Thomas Cranmer's words in 1552 are too archaic. But I wonder if we put anything really in that place. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. We don't need those particular words, do we? But repentance, turning to God and asking for forgiveness, is an essential part of our walk with him. Well, we've covered, or Luke has covered, a lot of ground this morning. And if you remember nothing else, remember that Jesus invites us to leave everything and follow him. He wants to be Lord. Remember that he has authority on earth to forgive sins, even my sins. And remember that he challenges us to live for him in his world and to repent and seek his forgiveness for when we fail.